Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Jason, Shalala, as well as um, Esther, for underpinning this first part of the talk. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is also um, a close reading of Bassam's expression, I am Arab, but also to kind of bring in some of his previous works as well, so from 2018 and 2019. Um, the works that kind of will sit a little bit closer to his um, personal history as well as um, um, questions of memory. So I kind of wanted to touch upon um, certain ideas on horizontality, transformation, memory, schemes, the body, dehumanization, glitches, sprouting, anime as well as a music genre called Vaporwave. Um, before I play this work called Fenced with the Silent Cold Wars that was made in 2018, um, I also would like to invite you to kind of look out the window here. Um, I wanted to think around the idea of perspective by thinking about the horizon as we are facing the English Channel, the Atlantic Ocean. And the horizon that we are seeing gives us a sense of orientation and a sense of temporal and spatial framework that situate, that situate us, which are based on a stable line. And this stable line is the horizon line. Horizon is used for determining our own location and relation to one's own surrounding destinations or ambitions, right? So as if we were sailing on a boat, on the ocean, we kind of look at the horizon to determine where we are within the ocean. So to think about horizon in relation to transatlantic migration, to the movement of people across the Atlantic Ocean, the effects of colonialism and slavery that is viewed with a linear perspective. And this linear perspective offers a central viewpoint that is the position with a sense of control and stability, and which is what we are seeing from the position that we are at now. And for us who are now located on the ground or on the shoreline, this ground can be imagined as stable, or not if one is on a boat. And when the migrants who arrive or not arriving on the shore by boat, this stability, this is uncertain, and this uncertainty is rendered by the unpredictability of the sea and the unpredictability of the future. So the horizon for the migrants on the boat is tilted and curved, and that is not a linear perspective. In this work, Fenced Within the Silent Cold Wars, Bassam takes the viewers through a recreation of Bassam's former home in Iraq, a home that is his family can no longer return to. And the home appears out of the expanse of an endless, desert. But someone said that he had a very protective childhood and kind of grew up in a bubble. And growing up in the 1990s in watching tons of Japanese cartoons in Iraq, Bassam said, cartoons have scenes of destruction, bombs exploding, weaponry, etc. And when you are seeing that in the form of a cartoon on the television, within the assumed safety of your own home, and then you are seeing the same activity happening on news reports, the reality and the fantasy, right, the reality outside of the home and the fantasy in the television, they were the same and you grew up feeling safe, safe laughing at his reality and fantasies.
So the horizon in this film indicates the sheltered safety, the assumed safety, the protected stability offered by the home that Bassam remembered during the Second Gulf War. Thank mm -hmm. you.
So these kind of reversal of interiority and exteriority is something that I also see in, for instance, when um, I am errors, trying to tease out what is the error within this gameplay, the kind of reversal of um, fantasy and reality, right? the assumed safety that is within the house and the fantasy that one trying to seek within another world, that might be the computer world, that might be the world outside. And, and also how the film ended. So in the opening sequence, it was the stable horizon that was the projection. And at the end, the sequence was that the horizontal plane converges into the abstract flat lines, and which these kind of um, ending created a sense of, again, assumed stability, but with the memory that has been disappeared. Um, and this is a really seminal text by Hito Shero where she talks about vertical perspective. And I quote here, as Erwin Panofsky argued, the construction of linear perspective declares the view of a one-eyed and immobile spectator as a norm. And this view is itself assumed to be natural, scientific, and objective. So the, the linear perspective that we are seeing out the window here and the kind of question of scientific, scientific objectivity 
is understood as impartiality, right? So it's we, we're viewing it from one stable position. And um, in scientific objectivity, the kind of view is often projected from above, from nowhere, which is a perspective that is under the guise of naturality or nowhere, and hides a very specific position. And in scientific discourses, this specific position would usually be male, white, heterosexual, and human. So in a way that the position that this very specific position is making a perspective that is often as understood as a universal perspective. So in situated knowledge, a scientific question in feminism and the privilege of partial perspective that was written by Donna Haraway in 1988, Haraway critiques the masculine bias in scientific culture. And she critiques the vague generalization while forwarding the concept of situated knowledge. So situated knowledge is where one takes a position that is a partial position because no one can ever see it all from above or see it all from one specific perspective. So the concept of situated knowledge argues that the perception of any situation is always a matter of an embodied, and that embodiment is through the eye seeing, through the visual, which locates the subject geographically and historically specific perspective, right? So within the feminist and queer argument is that this embodiment, this partiality, this specific situ um, position that one takes, that we can always only see it from a partial perspective, that we can never see it all. So this is a perspective that is constantly being structured and restructured by current conditions. And I continue the quote, thus, linear perspective is based on an abstraction, right, the abstract line that we're seeing at the end of the film, and does not correspond to any subjective perception. So when we're thinking about the exteriority and the interiority, linear perspective creates this illusion of a view to the outside through the window as if the image plane was a window opening to the real world, right? But then we just talked about the changing perspective, the condition that is constantly changing. What we are seeing as perceived as the real world, but it's not what is actually happening in the world right now. So to go back to this exhibition, I Am Error, in which we see small glitches, frictions, that confronts the perfect high resolution simulation, which usually aim to deceive us about the nature of reality. And um, I Am Error, the film, opens with the moving um, perspective. bias, masculinity bias within scientific research. In this film also, Bassam explores the construction of masculinity in an action adventurous video game and really confronts the armoring of the male body in gaming culture by querying and the military ethos. So again, when we, the querying is military ethos when we're thinking about gaming. And when we're thinking about war today, the relationship between war and gaming, that a lot of the wars nowadays are being fought by drones <coughs> without the soldier actually being fighting on the ground. So this is the kind of um, the, the perspective that Bassam is also focusing on, is the shifting perspective within video games. It's no longer just about leveling up. It's no longer just about winning, but it's also at the same time to kind of find error within it, to queer that kind of understanding of what um, video games is. And as the figure falls and finds himself landing on this overgrown land with 
silicon-looking rocks disrupting the horizon to distort the reality. The horizon is blurred, angled, but not necessarily denied. And in, in this process, our point of view keeps changing. And the figure, as the figure climbs onto the rock and the perspective shifts, we follow the subject as it establishes the surrounding view, which in turn gives us, the viewer, a body and a position. And we are not placed at the center of vision, nor a linear perspective that usually undermines our own representation and subjectivity. As the figure being submerged by the transformative bubble and landed on the transparent gluey sheets, this transparent gluey sheets is the space of liminal as the figure will transform into the next phase. Rolling with only the underpants and the almost nude transformation toward armored outfit. And this outfit is to be understood as schemes in video games that the player or the gamer would unlock. The gaming developers add schemes into the game at intervals, which allows players to choose their own experience as well as expressing their sense of style to the game. A skin is a graphic or audio downloadable, which changes the appearance of characters in video games. They're purely aesthetic. They don't increase the character's abilities or impact the outcome of the game. The skin encloses the body in a way just like the ego encloses the psychic. The ego, that is the conscious thinking subject, the player, the gamer, the figure, within a video game, the ego is to level up, to conquer, to take control. And this perspective that we just saw, it shifts from beneath of the sheets. And the literal meaning of the Latin perspectiva, it means to see through. So I think this is something that Bassam is trying to tease out, that even if we applied a different scheme, we don't actually achieve anything within the video game. But instead, it just allows the player, the gamer, to kind of acquire a sense of ego, right? To level up, to take control. Um, schemes is also something that the song has addressed in this film that he made in collaboration with Jennifer Mahigan in 2019, which is called I Follow My Millennial Death, Lust, Wherever It Takes Me. And this film explores themes of loss, nostalgia, isolation, and the internet. And the animated conversation or essay is a part of um, the, the ongoing discussion between the two artists. And the film itself doesn't have a soundtrack. And I quote here within the film, schemes connect as well as contain. So psychoanalysis Didier and Zeal introduced the term scheme ego in 1974, that a scheme is a container of the ego and a scheme ego registers traces of communication and manages intersensorial correspondence and functions as a protective shield that maintains thoughts, ideas, and effects. And if you have seen it in the exhibition already, that there is a film where it's the glistening arm that is coated with flies, is the arm that has already had this skin being dressed and in a way that it's not showing a process of decay just yet but it shows the process of a communication between the arm as well as the flies so it communicates the skin here acts in a way as a communicative interface between the figure 
and the other life forms, as we will see later, <coughs> of how the figure interacts with, for instance, the life form here, as the figure being coated with the skins. attitude that is the objectivist attitude, it establishes the universal claim for representation. But the perspective within this scene, it quickly changes to a cave-like setting where we follow the Quarian transformation of the figure as it is being armoured. So the corporeal body embodies the error, and the error is that in this game, the figure is not fighting, not controlling, but floating. The error is not an error at all, but rather a correction to the dominant narrative within the video games that were based around a hero. The 1990s Japanese anime, Sailor Moon, has been an inspiration for Basam, as well as a cartoon that I have been watching since growing up. And watching Sailor Moon's transformation as a child was the ultimate fantasy for anyone, I would say. And the stripped bare, kind of skin-tight, nude transformation into the heroine uniform, this transformation in a way that was not being represented in I am error. Since the figure transform in I am error is not ascending into the moon like Sailor Moon, but I will show the clip here anyway. I wanted us to kind of um, focus on the gesture of the hands and also the focusing on the hands to begin with. The nails as well as what the hand is signaling in Sailor Moon as well as in relation to the hand that has been shown in I Am Error.
So here the transformation that is signalled by the hand takes a much slower tempo and throughout this little segment it mentioned a broken time machine. The time machine I could think of is not only the time machine as a device that allows navigating parallel conditions of time and memory which allows one to travel within a different time zone, timeline, but also the backup mechanism of Apple's Mac OS, Mac OS, which is an artificial memory aid that allow us to externalize our memory. Memory as a form of knowledge which are now being objectified in everyday objects and apparatus. When Bassam's grandmother was burning all the memories in their material form, which is the photos, the clothes, the books, in a way the memory is no longer being objectified. And historically, when us as humans first used the stone tool to draw, we used our hands. We used our hands to hold pen to write down the events. We did drawings in the cave to document every single process. So the hand has always been used in this process of exteriorizing memory, externalizing memory, and today we type by hands. So in a way that the hand is absolutely vital in the process of transforming, transforming our memory onto digital devices. So the hand in a way become this carrier of memory. The hand is the technology of exteriorization, extraction and externalization. And I really like this quote from Giovanni's Room that was written by James Baldwin, in which this novel is about a bisexual man trying to find his position. And a quote on the hands, and I quote here. I thought it doesn't matter. It is only the body. It will soon be over. When it was over, I lay in the dark and listened to his breathing and dreamed of the touch of hands, of Giovanni's hands, or anybody's hands, hands which would have the power to crush me and make me whole again. And the hands kept on returning as a motif throughout the whole film. And at different stage of transformation, we read something like this on the screen. You grow less and less human. And through the different schemes that is armored by the figure, the figure lands on different horizon, floating in different spaces, the different in-between spaces. But some is indicating here that the figure is becoming dehumanized. And going back to the discussion on glitch, which we had already talked about in the first part of the talk, the glitch, the body, in a way is utilized to push back normative mainstream, right? The normative video game narrative. Writer and curator Legacy Russell argues that glitch feminism seeks opportunity to trigger errors within the flawed system. Glitch feminism embraces the causality of error. The glitch is a correction to the machine. As this figure falls onto another horizon, an uneven horizon, a horizon that is not based on a centralized viewpoint, the figure is faced with infinite, infinite possibilities, endless opportunities, and boundless promises. And this is where the error lies.
The glitch the pixels as being employed throughout the film. But some said once that he works with computer generated images like a painter. Painting that is being quoted in the film of the millennial death is in a way being perceived as all image oriented practices which offer touching and without touching at all. So when we're thinking about the skins earlier, the interaction between the skins and the fly, and the question of touching, these are the way in which Bassam paints. And the glitch the bodies, the pixelated blurry body that exists in these kind of space in between are encrypted and coded which allows for the body to be not readable, not categorized, not identified, not recognized, and ultimately not captured. And this is a clip from the millennial death, which we can see the layering of the kind of malleable digital images onto the tree. And in I am error, Basal materialized this way of layering onto um, the material object with the material painting. Painting. And here is a clip of artist Jeffrey Skoda explains what digital painting is. Thing, right? What digital painting actually is, is it's kind of these things getting sort of smashed together, right? It's the idea that you are going to be painting with a medium that is reproducible and is not necessarily valued based on its uniqueness, and, uh, but in a tradition that does value things based on its reproducibility, or non-reproducibility, as I would say. So, digital painting is kind of an interesting topic in that sense. So, as I was saying, the simplest possible digital painting would have to be a one-by-one -one pixel image and could either be black or white. But, as we all know, digital image formats don't necessarily have to be shown on a computer, right? So here we are on the screen, and I could, you know, I could give you a little, a little example of this, of this kind of image here, right? I could basically say, all right, we're going we're gonna to use this super cool painting program that I made that allows you to paint one pixel paintings. So now we have a black painting, and now we have a white painting, right? And so, just like I was showing you before, this is basically our one by one pixel image, but it's not defined by the computer itself, right? We're talking about abstract thought here, right? In the same sense that Albert Einstein would go ahead and he would have a, you know, Albert Einstein would have like a, a, a blackboard or something like that, and he would go to the blackboard and he would say, E equals MC squared. Right? Now, it doesn't necessarily matter that this is projected uh, on a camera, it doesn't matter what pen I draw this with, right? because what we care about in information is we care about the actual ideas that are presented to us. Right? We don't necessarily care about the fact that it's on paper, we just care about the fact that it's, uh, you know, that the, that the formula is there, right? that the info relationships are there. So that's basically what we're, you know, what we're kind of you know, thinking about when it comes to digital painting. So here we can change the color of these things, like this. But then we can get into some other ideas, right? What if we were gonna go, what if we were gonna go up in resolution? What if we were gonna use more than one pixel, right? What if we were gonna go so high in resolution that we could do a two by two pixel image? Oh yeah, two by two, right? Then you can then you can start to do a couple more different things. But then what if we were gonna do a four by four pixel image, right? We can still sort of pick one pixel at a time, but then if we were gonna do an eight by eight, you know, then things start to get a bit interesting. Right around this point, right around this point when you have this much information, you can actually start to draw a mark, 
and see that you can actually draw a mark, right? If you're only using one pixel, you don't necessarily, or you're not really able to create paint strokes, right? You're not really able to create marks, if you will. So um, when Jeffrey Skoda is kind of giving the example of Einstein's equation, the kind of information that he said, we don't care what is on the paper, but it's just the information. So the, the kind of um, digital painting and its um, pixelated material form kind of in a way allow me to think Bernard Stiegler's ideal of hypermaterialization which is a process that describes a form of everyday reality where material appliances transform everything into information and subject it into endless transformation, right? So to think about the material painting, the digital painting, the digital painting that is made up by information that is represented as pixels, that in the hypermaterial fields, matter is always already form, and form is always already information. So matter is being rendered informationally. Information is sliced into nanoseconds and nanoscale, right? As Jeffrey Skoda is um, drawing with the different pixel scales. The information is turned into these kind of tiny scales. So the dematerialization of the body in this film the dematerialization of the digital body is actually a process of hypermaterialization, right? So the infinitely small and infinitely short matter becomes invisible, but not immaterial. So as the figure landed on the pixelated horizon, the perspective changes again to a top-down perspective, as opposed to before from the bottom-up perspective. And in this 1990s Nintendo game, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, this perspective, the top-down perspective, is also being employed. And previously, they had games that is applying the, the, the perspective that is the side-scrolling, where you can see the figure going level up and level down. But in this game, it returned to the top-down perspective. And in a way that this kind of perspective allow the game to introduce the, the parallel worlds, which is also something that we see in I Am Era as the different transformation, whether you are landing onto a different perspective or arriving at a different perspective, it kind of introduced the parallel worlds. And um, as I Am Era is going to overthrow the kind of mainstream narrative within gameplay, right, so the relationship with the big boss at the end of the film with the dragon is in a way that to overthrow the idea of the relationship with the boss here. So in The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past here, we can see how the figure overthrow the boss.
is uh, shown here between the boss, that is the dragon, and the figure, is that the in a way that perhaps the dragon had rescued the figure, rather than the figure trying to defeat him, the big boss. Mm. And in a way that it shows, it's a process of querying this hierarchical, patriarchal space that has always been the mainstream narrative of video games. And again here that we're seeing the hand as the returning motif within the film come to hold the figure rather than crushing the figure. This, um, it's a micro genre of electronic music that only happened um, in the early 2000s and this music genre only existed on the internet. And partially this music genre is kind of slowing down and chopping up different samples from jazz, R&B and lounge music from the 80s and the 90s. So again, it kind of gives a sense of nostalgia, but for people who are born in the late 80s, 90s, 2000s, the kind of sense of nostalgic is in a way that you don't know what you're nostalgic about. <clears throat> you didn't grow up with this kind of music genre in the first place. So Vaporwave is in a way that it takes on, it's a satirical take on a consumer capitalism and popular culture that is always reproducing something that sounds very similar, that was sounds that existing already. In a way that is an engagement with um, aesthetic from technology as well as advertising from the previous times. And um, Vaporwave is also something that is being discussed between Jennifer and Bassam in a millennial death film, which is a film without soundtrack and here Play a clip of my boy.
Vaporwave reconfigures music from the past through the use of chopped and screwed techniques, repetition and heavy reverb. And as we just heard now, it's the kind of reiteration of an error. It's the kind of glitching and the reiteration, the constant reiteration of such glitch. And in a way that within these spaces of glitches, what happens is resistance. And I think this is also what the figure within I am error is trying to present, is that the kind of resistance towards a certain not, a narrative that is a mainstream narrative. And um, to go back to the idea of the body, These are sketches that um, Masson has made um, throughout making these films. And the idea of the corporeal, the body, has been discussed quite extensively across history. And we understand the body through the glitch, the reiteration of the error as a tool. The body is filled with potential, and as with glitch, that is filled with movement. The body is the material form, to something that has no form, something that is abstract. And we all began in abstraction, engendered and categorized. So to dematerialize is to abstract, is to dehumanize. And the body transcends beyond the skin as a site that concerns boundaries that create the distinction between the interior and the exterior the distinction within binaries, temporal and spatial frameworks. And through this shifting and moving perspective Bassam is presenting here, I am error carves out other possibilities, other realities, and it is a negotiation between reality, memory, and masculinity. I spent some time um, trying to understand um, the sprouting on the figure, on the figure's head. And in a way that I return to the idea of spout sprouting as to kind of understand when a potato sprouts, we often being told that we cannot eat potato when that sprouts. But then also the precise reason that potato sprouts is because it's a seed. If it sprouts, you bring it back to the earth and then it will grow more. So in a way, when the figure is being confronted with being less and less human, being dehumanized, the figure, his ultimate aim is to return to the earth, to become a seed again.
the body dissolves in the end, the figure ends this relationship with the gamey narrative and social practice of the body. It let go of the material of the normative. It withdraw from the perceived gendered construction of the body. It manifests a different understanding of it that embraces the abstract as the matter, the hyper-materialized body. Through the process of encountering other life forms, the figure, the player, disidentifies himself and makes up his own way of resolving the gameplay and the construct of the body. The figure demands a new perspective, a perspective that is not linear and not centralized.